Good morning, everyone. Yeah, it's good to see you out this morning. And I, whoever keeps talking to me, there's several of you, talking about how I control the temperature in here. If I controlled the temperature in here, it would be a lot colder right now because I've already started sweating through my shirt and we hadn't even got started. So it's going to be one of those days. But uh, turn with you, if you will, to the, your Bibles. And we want to look at Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, we're going to look at verses 7 through 14. Verse 7 through 14 really go along with verses 1 through 6 because it's all one celebration of Paul concerning salvation and what, what brings about the beginnings of the church. And, and as we've mentioned before, Paul gets really excited here. I mean, really excited. And he just kind of piles terms on, uh, on top of one another. I mean, and, and I just thought about it as I was studying this and trying to, to translate it some in the, from the original language and trying to figure out some of the words and whatnot. And, and uh, it's been a while since I translated this portion of Ephesians, so it reminded me again how difficult it is to uh, translate this particular portion. But have you ever been, as I was thinking about it, have you ever been around somebody who, when they're excited, they use more words in a, in a few minutes than you do in a whole day? You ever been around people like that? Well, several weeks ago, I was around somebody who, who uses lots of words. And, and I'm not one, I mean, I do a lot of words up here, but that's about the quota for my week after I get done on Sunday morning. That's Melody. She says, how was your day? Good. That's sufficient. That describes my day. And and, uh, but anyway, I was with this person and they were excited about an opportunity they had come in their way. And so I just asked them about this opportunity and it was just like, Bleh! it just went, Bleh! and I didn't have to talk anymore. It was great. I just, we had a great conversation. This person told me everything that I needed to know and everything that I didn't need to know and anything that I wasn't even really concerned about. That was all there. And it was just, Bleh! it just went on. That's, that's Paul here. He, he gets excited when he starts talking about this. And so last week we looked at the first stanza. And Paul's just getting started in verses 1 through 6. When we get to 7 through 14, well, then he really turns up the, the excitement level and, and it just gets more and more convoluted in, as, as far as trying to diagram this sentence and, and whatnot. But the first, celebra- the first stanza of the celebration we, we looked at last week, which was just a celebration of God's plan for this thing we call the church and the glorious plan of salvation. And each stanza in this, as you, if you mark in your Bibles, you can underline this, but each stanza ends with to the praise of his glory. So if you look down and, and you see at the end of, of verse 6, you say, in, or the beginning of verse 6, to the praise of his glory. And then you, you get down into verse 11, which is another stanza that uh, is the second stanza ending, and it says to the praise of of his glory. And then you see it again at the end of verse 14, where he talks in the third stanza, he brings it together and says, To the praise of his glory. We mentioned last week that the first stanza looks back into the past, and it really is about the actions of the Father, God the Father. Now, the second stanza that we'll look at today is about Jesus Christ and the actions of Jesus Christ in providing redemption for us. How, this is how we become part of God's family through the, the son who was sent by the father because of a plan he made before the foundations of the earth. And then in this passage, in this stanza, it says, in the fullness of time or at the right time, God sent his son. Then verses 13 and 14 is the third stanza and it talks about the, whole, the role of the Holy Spirit and that looks towards the future. First six verses look towards the past, the work of God the Father. The middle section or the second stanza emphasizes the active work of Christ and bringing people to salvation. What he took care of on the cross continues to be taking place even today as people are putting their faith and trust in the glorious gospel. And in verses 13, 14, look towards that future where we will spend eternity with him, which is where all of this culminates and the Holy Spirit's role in that. And so as we look at it, we see that Paul's excitement just begins to build as, 
as he thinks and he rehearses in his mind and as he writes these words to the Ephesian believers, he, gets, he just gets overwhelmed with all that God has done in this thing called the glorious gospel in the establishing of his church. And so he, he, it's clearly evident as you read this because, like I say, he just piles concept on concept in this massively long run-on sentence that makes grammarians sweat. It's just one of those things. And, and so I think Paul just couldn't help but get excited as he contemplated all that God had done in the comprehensiveness of God's plan. We can summarize it this way. God's plan of salvation was established before the foundation of the world. It is being displayed in the present and has been guaranteed for the future for all those who put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. That's the comprehensive nature. There is no aspect of our life or the life of this world that is not covered in this. Before the foundations of the world, God established a plan. He has been working that plan from then till now, and there is still yet a future that has been guaranteed by the Holy Spirit. That's the comprehensiveness. And so when Paul thought about it, he got very excited. I think it also was a major driving force in what Paul did once he met Jesus Christ on that Damascus road. The reason why he was motivated to continue to go, no matter what opposition he faced, he kept moving forward. And I think this understanding and this ever awareness of the greatness of this comprehensive plan of God was a driving force. Now, it is unfortunate, in my opinion, especially for those of us who have grown up in the church, these magnificent truths that we're looking at have sometimes, or if we're not careful, become old news. Yeah, I've heard that. Yeah, I know about that. I'm hoping, though, as we take a closer look at this passage, it will once more ignite the same kind of excitement that Paul had. It will ignite it in us. Now, it's hard for me to imagine after spending the week going through this again, it's hard to me imagine not doing so. But here's one thing I know. Here's one thing for sure. Such excitement is essential to being the church of God or the church that God wants us to be and our community needs us to be. So listen to it as I read the second and third stanza of this celebration of God's comprehensive plan. Remembering last week, we looked at the first one, which looks to the past. But listen to stanzas two and three as we focus in on the work of the Spirit and the work of the Son. Here's what it says, starting in verse 7. In Him, referring to Christ, in Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and in insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to the purpose which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of times uh, to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth and the gospel of your salvation and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of of his glory. Now, that's what we want to look at this morning. Let's pray and ask God to open our eyes and, and our hearts to the truths that we find here. Let's pray together. Lord, we come to this passage again with great humility. We recognize that everything that is said in this passage is totally undeserved by us. Totally. There is nothing we could do, nothing we could earn our way to or, or buy. It was all a free gift given by you. And when we think about the enormity of what you've done, I pray that it will, will in, in, 
engage us in our hearts and, and draw us into an excited state of recognizing that you are a great God and greatly to be praised, deserving of all of our worship and acts of service. God, do that work, we pray this morning in Christ's name. Amen. Now, let's go back and look at each one of these stanzas together. Like I said, the first stanza is in verse, or it talks about the provision of the Son. And the first stanza is in verses 7 through 12. All right, 7 through 12. And he talks about two major aspects here of the work of Christ, the provision that the Son has given to us. He talks about in verses 7 through 10, our redemption. We need to talk a little bit about that. And then in verses 11 and 12, he talks about our heritage. Okay, and what does all that mean? And then as we look at uh, the, the, the second or the third stanza, the second point that we'll look at today is, is that future pledge, of the, the, the future look, the pledge of the Holy Spirit in verses 13 and 14. So let's look at verses 7 through 12 first of all and look at the aspect of what has the Son provided us. The first thing that Paul gets excited about is the provision of this thing called redemption. Now, the word redemption, there are several different words in the Greek New Testament that can be translated in very similar fashion to this concept of redemption. The word that Paul uses here was specific and unique in one sense. It referred to the purchasing of a slave with the intent to set them free. Now, if we look back through world history, and even in, in today's present day history, we know about slavery. We know about some of the abuses of slavery. We know that in some situations it was more of an economic situation. But we also know that it was very difficult to get in, or, or not to get in, but to get out of it, especially if you were trying to pay a debt. But there was, there was a practice, and this word is, is behind that practice. There was a tradition where if somebody wanted to set somebody free, they had to purchase the slave, and then the intent was to let them go. And that's this word redemption that Paul uses here. Now, it's a fitting term. We can talk about the ethics of, of slavery and all that kind of thing. We can talk about that. We can talk about why does God, is God's economy have it all part of that. We, we discussed some of that in our study in the pastoral epistles. But here's what I want you to understand, that this is an, this is an appropriate uh, illustration of what God's done for us. Because you see, the slave that was bought had no means of getting themselves out of slavery in and of themselves. They were in debt well, guess what the Bible teaches us? We are what? Dead in our trespasses and sins. We are slaves to sin. We have no means whatsoever to set ourselves free from sin. But Jesus Christ came because of this plan that God did before the foundations of the world that he established, Jesus Christ came, as we see in this passage, in the fullness of time or at the right time in God's plan, he came in order to become the perfect sacrifice for our sins, to buy us back, to set us free. That's what Romans 6 tells us, that we've been set free from the bondage of sin. So therefore, don't yield yourselves as instruments of unrighteousness. God has given us this great gift for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. We are told, for by grace are you saved through faith, not of works, but a, what? Gift of God, lest any man should boast. That's, that's what Paul's talking about here. This redemption, we've been bought, we've been purchased with the intent to set free. This is why it was unthinkable to the Apostle Paul when someone would say, well, and Paul said it this way, he said, where sin abounds, so also does grace. Grace abounds. So there's no amount of sin that you can come to today with in this place and say, I have too much sin for Jesus to take care of it. Absolutely not. He can take care of it all. And then some. He takes care of it all if we just come to him in faith. And so it is unthinkable that we would ever 
think of going back to these things. Because Paul says, we're great, we're sin abounds, so does grace. And then some said, well, if sin, you know, if we can experience more God's grace, should we not sin all the more? And Paul's response is, absolutely not. Have I ever told you the southern uh, slang version of the Bible? Have you ever heard about that? Anybody heard of the southern slang Bible? Yeah, they have one. The Greek phrase, I'm going to get myself in big trouble, real big trouble. But the Greek phrase is meganoito. It's a double negative. So you grammarians, live with it, okay? Just get over it. Double negative means, Paul says, should we sin all the more? And Paul says, no, not never. The southern slang, there's so much trouble. There really is a version. I'm not making this up. The southern slang says, hell no. That's what it says. Now, you might say, oh, that's sacrilegious. Well, if you grew up in the South, it makes complete sense. There's a bunch of rednecks running around out there. You know, you never know. But, hey, before you start busting on the South where I come from, there's a bunch of them in New Hampshire, too. <laughs> so, but that, it just puts that strong emphasis on it. Like, no, never, not, ever, don't even think about it. That's what Paul's saying. Why? Because you've been set free. Set free. You've been bought from your bondage and you've been set free. That's, that's something to get excited about, is it not? I mean, come on, think about that. Just think about your past week, all the things that God had to forgive you for. Not to mention your whole life. And you've been set free from it. That's amazing. That's amazing. And so, we, we, how can, how can, yeah, I can understand why Paul, I'm starting to do the same thing Paul did. Run on, 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 on. <laughs> he goes on and he talks about this redemption we've been bought with this, we've been purchased in order to be set free. And then he piles on this concept in the latter part of verse 7. He says this, he says, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, the forgiveness it's, I mean, it's one thing to have our debt canceled, but now to be forgiven. There's a beautiful illustration in the book of Philemon. When Paul meets Philemon, or Paul writes Philemon because of a slave named Onesimus who had run away from Paul. And Paul says, look, whatever debt he has, charge it to my account, but receive him now as a brother in Christ. He's been set free. Now he's been returned to you. He was once unprofitable. Now he is profitable. Why? Because he has been bought by Jesus Christ and set free. Receive him. Receive him. So it's just an amazing thing. And, and what Paul is asking him, and you watch the argumentation, Paul masterfully puts it together in an argument. He says basically to Philemon, forgive him. Receive him back. You now won a brother in the Lord. Forgive him. It's all based on what Christ has already done for us. And so you see this and you say, man, we, we've been set free. We've been redeemed. We've been forgiven. And if that's not enough, then you get to verse 8 and verse 10. And he talks about the extent. Look at this phrase. He lavishes it upon us. Verse 8, which he lavished upon us. That's a great word. It's not a word we use a lot, but trust me, what this word means that it is more than what you could ever imagine. And if you need to understand what he means when he says lavish, because maybe it's not a word that you've heard very often, but listen to what he says. He says this. He says, you've been forgiven according to the riches of his grace. Do you hear that? He's lavished this on us and, and, and in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ. But look at the first part there when it says, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. And listen, here's, I, I think, the best way to understand lavish. And it says, according to the riches of his grace. Now stop and think about that. He could write that grammatically a couple of different ways. He could have said, he could have said that we have been given uh, forgiveness. He's lavished it on us. Uh, 
not, not just as it has here, according to his riches in grace, but it doesn't say not out of. Now, if, if, I, if I took you up to my office where I have my wallet, and I said, I'm going to give you out of the abundance of my riches. <laughs> Don't get excited. Uh, <laughs> if I brought you to my wallet, all my wallet has is whatever is left over from the allowance that I get for the month. And what, what is July 18th? I, I'm running low on allowance at this point. All right? But if I said, I'm going to give you a gift in accordance to the riches that I have, it's, don't steal, don't get excited. But I guarantee you it's a lot more than what comes out of my wallet. Okay? And so what Paul is saying here, he says he's not giving you, he's not lavishing you uh, uh, just a small portion from the, his riches, but he is lavishing upon you according to the extent of his riches. You see the difference? That, that, it, 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 he's, he's just not saying, here, I'll give you a little bit. No, he's given us, he's lavished upon us that more than we can ever imagine in his grace and in his mercy. That, that's what he's talking about here. He says, it's not according, it, it is according to, not out of. It's to the full extent, not just a portion. And he gives us this grace, he says in verse 8, that he lavishes on us, which we have, he's lavished upon us in all wisdom and in insight. And so there's two ways to look at wisdom and insight too. And again, because grammatically this, this is a messed up sentence, but I think the best way to understand it is that it is referring to what we have received. We have an understanding of this mysterious uh, thing that is called the church, what God is doing. We have ability to understand it, the mystery of his will and the uniting of all things in him. And Paul is going to talk about the uniting, the breaking down of the wall between um, um, ethnic groups, between racial groups, between those that are Jewish or those that are Gentile. He's going to talk about all that and all of them becoming one in Christ Jesus. And so as we have come to know Jesus Christ, he gives to us, he lavishes upon us. We understand. Have you ever thought those times when you're, you're talking to somebody about the Lord and about the gospel and you know they understand what you're saying, but it still seems like it's just not getting through? Well, the reason why it makes complete sense to us is because God has lavished on us the, the understanding of his mystery and his grace and his uniting of all things. And so this means that, by, that, that we uh, can understand what God has done in this glorious gospel and the establishing of his church. We can understand it and accept what God has done. That's the beauty of this. And so that's our redemption. But Paul's just getting started. The provision of Christ, yes, has to do with redemption. He's given us freedom from sin. He's given us this forgiveness. And he's lavished upon us with all, according to all of his riches, this grace and wisdom. But he's also given us a heritage. Look at verse 11 and verse 12. In him, we have obtained an inheritance having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things to the counsel of his will. And this is one of those verses where everybody wants to get fixated on predestination and they forget about what he's saying. Can we, can we just for a moment stop arguing about the theological terms and step back and, and think what Paul really wanted you to understand is this. You have been given an inheritance, a heritage. That's the amazing thing. Now, you can translate this two different ways. Some will translate it. Some of your translations will say that God has received a heritage in us and that we are his heritage. The other way of translating, because there's a passive tense here and, and it, could, it, it could go either way, but it could also mean that we have obtained an inheritance. But when you study the context, I think it's very clear that Paul is not talking about God has an inheritance, although there are plenty of verses that talk about that. Malachi chapter 3 talks about that. John chapter 6 talks about that, that we are an inheritance to God. And that's mind-blowing in and of itself. I, I have a hard time wrapping my mind that I am considered to be an inheritance to God. 
Now, now just think about that for a moment. I, you, who believe in Jesus Christ, are God's inheritance. That's what it says in Malachi chapter 3. That's what it says in, in John chapter 6. We're, we're an inheritance to God. Seems like God's not going to be too excited about getting that kind of an inheritance. But when I get his salvation, which is what this passage is talking about, as an inheritance, as one of his children, now that sounds like I'm getting the better end of the deal. And we are. You see, both, both translations are legitimate. There's no doubt about it. But the context, I think, means that it really is the second one that we have obtained an inheritance. We've received an inheritance. Paul, Peter talks about that too in chapter 1. And so we have obtained this inheritance, this inheritance of salvation, this inheritance of being brought into the body of Christ called the church. We have received this fully and freely. It's our heritage. It's who we are. It's how we are defined. We are no longer defined by our past, but we are defined as our identity is found in Jesus Christ. That is something that is a rich, rich inheritance. And so all of this comes to the conclusion in the stanza where it's about the praise, God's purpose is the praise of his glory for his established plan and practice resulting all in his praise and his glory. See it there? It says, in him we have attained this inheritance having been predestined. It's all part of God's plan according to the purpose as part of his will for him who works all things according to his counsel of his will so that we who are the first to hope in Christ. Now, here Paul now begins to make a distinction. Up until this he's been talking about everybody but now he talks about we who were the first to believe referring to the Jews and he's talking to primarily a Gentile but then he's going to bring them all together and say but we've all become one in Christ but he wants to help us understand here that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory see it wasn't about being first it was about what God was doing and God is establishing. And, and he started with the Jews and he went to the, the Samaritans. And then from the Samaritans, he went to the Gentiles. Study the book of Acts. That's the way it went. But all had brought together under Christ. And so this is God's established plan and it's his practice, all of which will result in the praise and the glorification of God. You see, here's the point. The lavishness of our redemption should not only cause us to break out in praise of God, but to live to bring glory to his name. Now, we, Cam and I have talked quite a bit about the stiffness of Calvary Bible Church when it comes to worship. You notice he gets a little freer when he's up here and he's doing all these things. And, and yeah, I'm going to throw you under the bus here, buddy. And... And, he, and he's doing that because he wants you to become more free. Okay, yep, see, Shireen wants everybody to come free too. I may have been born in the South, but I belong in New England. <laughs> so my free is going to be a lot different than Cam's free, okay? My free may be more, a lot different than Shireen's free. But guess what? In God's economy, free is free. So enjoy it. It should cause us to break out and shout. We should get excited. We should understand that what Jesus Christ has done for us and provided for us is beyond comparison and beyond measure, and it cannot be matched ever, ever, ever. Okay, you get it? That should be something we say, wow. But it doesn't stop there. That's just the second stanza. God, thank you to the praise of his glory. But then, you see, we've looked at the past, what God the Father did. He planned it out. We've looked at the present, what Jesus Christ is doing as people are coming to know the Lord over and over and over again. I was just at a Gideon's banquet last night and, and hearing now through people having the Word of God placed in their hand and various circumstances actually opening it up and reading it and God miraculously saving them. We should never get tired of that because that's what God's doing around the world today. That's his present work, okay? But there's also a future aspect of this. He's already mentioned the Spirit, but listen to verses 13 and 14 when he now talks about the pledge of the Spirit as he looks towards that future. It's good that God had a plan in the past. 
it's good that God saved me now, but what about the future? Well, that's been guaranteed. Notice what he does say here in verse 13 and 14. He says, in him, again, remember, that Paul uses that in him phrase, I think 160 times in his Pauline epistles. I've told you that is, is theology. When we place ourselves in him, that's something that is extra special. That's, that's, that's what he planned before the foundations of the world. That's why Jesus Christ came, so that we could be placed in him. We'd be clothed in his righteousness. That's what this is talking about. He's bought us with a price. It's not something we did. He did it. And now we've been given this Holy Spirit that seals us until the day of redemption, until we go to receive that eternal reward. This is amazing. This is amazing. So it goes on and he says, In him you also... When you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire the possession of it to the praise of his glory. You see, again, we get the good end of the deal, but it's all going to be to the praise of his glory. We, we, we have this guaranteed for us, this pledge we have been sealed. That word sealed is, a, is an old Roman term kind of that is used. And, and it means a guarantee or the sign of ownership. And so when a letter came from the king, so to speak, and you wanted to make sure that it really did come from the king, they would put a piece of wax or a drop of wax and then put a stamp on it and seal that letter. That meant that it was sealed in the king's name. That's what the Holy Spirit did. God the Father our glorious reigning king sent his son who then left and gave us the Holy Spirit who now has been placed inside of us and that is the seal that we've been declared possession by the king. Guaranteed. That's what it's saying. That's the seal. And the word guaranteed here is the earnest deposit on what is to come. Notice how he says it here. This is, this is amazing. He says, the guarantee of our inheritance until we require, acquire possession of it. It is ours already, but there's still coming a day when we will get to experience it. We're experiencing lots of it now. We've been set free from sin. We have the ability to live unto Christ. We have the ability to enjoy the blessings of relationship with him. But there's still yet more to come. And the Holy Spirit is that seal, that guarantee until we acquire it physically. It's, there's coming today. And the Holy Spirit is the guarantee of that. And all of it will be to the praise of his glory. Here's what I want to suggest to you this morning. Our lives should reflect the greatness of the inheritance that awaits for us. We should walk and move as children of the king. We should live and face our future as if it has been guaranteed, and it has. And so there's nothing to worry. He's lavished on us his forgiveness. We can stumble and we can fall, but it's been guaranteed. We've been sealed until the day of redemption. You know, when our daughter Tiffany was really young, she had a little dolly. It was, I don't know, I can't remember the name of it, but it was her favorite doll. She would sleep with that doll. And you know how little children who can sleep very soundly, and I'm jealous of now, getting up two or three times a night is just, but she would sleep so soundly that it would, she would slobber on it. She's going to kill me if she's watching just that, that thing would just start getting nasty. And so we just had to cut it open, take the filling out, wash it, and then do it very quickly and so that she didn't know that we had destroyed a little dolly, put it back together, and it would be there at bedtime for her ready to go. And that thing got so nasty, we're thinking, you know, surely, Tiffany, wouldn't you like a different doll? No. Nope, that, that's, that's my doll. That's my possession. She, that's how she went to sleep. It was, it was that, that little comforter for her. And she wanted no other doll. She had plenty of them, but she had to have this one. Anytime we went on an airplane, anytime we went on a trip, she had to have this doll, dolly. It didn't matter how wonderful or how many other dollies we would have promised her, she had to have this one. And I think most of us as parents or even as children, if we just stop and 
say, we've had those favorite things, you know, the little blankets that you smell every time you're feeling stress. <laughs> they stink, but it, it's just it's a comfort. I, I don't know. I don't, I don't get it. But we've all had it. We've all seen it. I wonder. I wonder if we're not a little bit like that when it comes to our salvation, when it comes to what God's done for us. Here's the question I want to ask you. Are we more excited about what we have now or what awaits? Are we fighting harder for what now is or are we on mission to tell people about what awaits? You see, if, if, if we really understand this and we understand the purpose for which God has done all this, it puts us on mission. And we should be more about what's coming. I know for me, I'm already thinking about next college football season. You're thinking about next, um, what is that team you guys root for, the Patriots? You're thinking about that guy. Eh, we, we, we're all thinking about that. We're all talking about it. We're all anticipating it. Are we hanging on more to what's here than the greatness of what we've been provided in Jesus Christ that's been guaranteed by the Spirit because of what God planned thousands of years ago? How are we living our lives? I trust just a refresher of what we've been given will renew and ignite that excitement again. And we will walk out of this place and we will look for opportunities to tell people, you won't believe what I know. It'll change the way we look at life. It'll change the way we look at our conversations. It'll change the way we look at our world. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, we thank you for your word I can understand why Paul went on and on and on. Just piled concept on concept on concept. Because there just, it just really is too much to even really compre comprehend. There really is just too much to even really understand. But what little we do understand should cause us to be like Paul, ignited with a passion to tell our world about the greatness of the gospel. It should ignite a passion for us, as messy as it can be, to engage with your people so that we can accomplish your mission. Do that work, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.